So people that feel safe don't tend to play games. They don't need to, right? Because they don't think that the threat envi- there is a threat in the environment. They feel safe in that environment. So it's a big indicator as well of somebody's internal state when they play a lot of games, right? Or if they don't play games and you're spot on, it's impossible to get intimacy from that place if you try and play games. And we actually know that secure, safe attachment is the best and most effective survival strategy. Thomas, welcome to A Word to the Wise. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to speak with you. I've been looking to get a couple of therapists on the show for a while to talk about attachment styles and attachment theory. So I feel like this is a well overdue conversation on the podcast. But thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I'm really well, and I'm really excited about this conversation also because I feel, you know, when I look online, there's so much different advice going around that isn't really grounded in science and things that actually work that often I think confuse people more than it helps them. And what is amazing about emotional focus couple therapy, it's really well researched and it kind of gives us a framework for how to navigate and create self safe, flourishing relationships. And that's quite exciting that we actually have that nowadays. Yes, it is so exciting. And speaking about so much information out there and getting confused, I know attachment theory is something that people talk about a lot. They tend to talk about the anxious versus avoidant. And I'm going to ask you what the different attachment styles are in a little bit. But yes, I'm looking for some more grounded uh, science-based information and discussion around this topic. Now I want to ask you what sparked your interest in couples therapy and specializing in attachment theory? That's a good question. And I think it came from the fact that I messed up my own um, 12 year relationship. And I remember literally the day after my partner had moved out, I bought this book by Sue Johnson called Hold Me Tight. And I was lying there in the evening reading this book because I wanted to understand what has happened. And as I started to read about the attachment styles and the different dynamics, she called them dances that we get into. I could literally see, like imagine being in a movie Matrix. It was like this. I could see everything that has gone wrong. And in that moment, my anger and resentment got replaced with this huge sense of compassion, both towards my partner or ex-partner, but also towards myself. Because it was no longer about her being the enemy or me self-blaming and say I was wrong. I could suddenly see these old dances that we brought with us from a very, very young nervous system that we unconsciously have continued to play out and how they didn't interact well together and how that got us off track. Right. And it was so incredible to just have that moment of complete clarity and then also be able to move forward and actually implement that to create very, very different dynamics because there now was an actual structure. And you could also now easily see when you went out of that, why we were now out of balance. Right. And there was a template for how do we get back into balance again? I always find it very interesting when someone's profession um is spurred out of a personal moment or something, you know, significant happens in their life that completely shifts their perspective or, you know, brings them to a new subject matter that illuminates what the problem was. And now it's like this narrow focus to better understand it and to, in some ways, teach it and offer help to couples who are struggling with, understanding one another, looking at each other, it's you versus me, because that's how a lot of couples look at themselves. It's not, oh, we're a team. We need to figure this out together. So what are the different types of attachment styles? So the literature kind of defines four key attachment styles that, and again, I think what I just want to say before this is because often people hear this and then they go to their partner and say, oh, I heard this, you are X, Y, and Z. This is not something that's meant to be used to blame other people. Actually, it's meant to be able to help us have compassion for other people and understand why their primal nervous system respond in certain ways to try and restore safety, right? And also we're not defined. Our attachment styles is not who we are and they're even changeable, which is very fascinating. So over time, exposure to a secure, safe dynamic, we know that the nervous system actually changes. So I just want to say that before, so people don't think, oh my God, this is me. Um, It's not a definition of who you are. So the four attachment styles that you mentioned, obviously, 
um, anxious and avoidant, but let's start with secure attachment. So we have a framework for what a balanced individual actually look like, right? Because what for some people, what does that even look like? So somebody with secure attachment definitely haven't had perfect parenting. We even know securely attached, you know, adults had parents who missed the tuned about 70% of the time. So it's not about perfection. You don't have to hit yourself if you're a parent and say, oh, I've been a bad parent. But what they had is they tend to have parents who responded to their needs and distress, who respected their boundaries. And in that, they formed a model of the world that was people are going to respect me. People are safe. People are going to respond to my needs. It's safe to get close to someone. And I'm also fine on my own, meaning they much, much, much faster restore balance. They have a much wider, what we call window of tolerance, where they can move with stress much more before they lose control and can't bring themselves back. While people who haven't had that responsiveness, they don't have that flexibility in their nervous system. They don't anticipate that somebody is going to respond to them. So they need defensive strategies to keep themselves safe, right? And this is where we come into all the other free, which all are actually anxious um, attachment styles, even though we don't have that label for all of them. But let's start with anxious attachment. Anxious attachment is someone who might have had, let's say, somebody who might have abandonment, a father who maybe suddenly have left, or there has been something that had created that nervous system to fear a sense of abandonment, to feel that they had to let go of a sense of self to appease others to get what they want. It's often associated with what we call the people pleaser, right? Very classical. The anxious attachment is a person who will ruminate a lot. So when things don't go wrong, they will keep thinking, what if I had done this? Or oh, what if I had done this? Maybe my relationship would have worked out. That's the anxiously attached yeah the avoidant doesn't do that at all right so they tend to get very anxious and they need you know often a lot i don't like the word needy we use that a lot in our culture but that's again because we don't understand what's below there's a child that didn't have that responsiveness that had somebody who was not consistent in that right and that made the nervous system of a small child feel really anxious right which is very very normal adaptive behavior and for that they tried to please this other person to make sure they would continue to get their needs and as a child you need that because if your parents don't attend to you well you actually die so it is life or death and this nervous system is with us even through adulthood to the day we we, we die then we have avoidant attachment, which is somebody who often had parents who didn't respond, who ignored their needs. And what it was all classical. Remember when they said, let the babies cry, you know, because otherwise they won't learn to be independent. We now know from science this is nonsense. And it's very, very harmful because what happened is a baby, unlike an adult, can't regulate. The part of the brain that regulates emotion isn't developed yet. It only started around age eight and finished around mid 20s. So a young baby, have no way of regulating emotion, okay? So when they start getting dysregulated and cry because they need food, they're tired, they're cold, whatever it is, and nobody comes to respond, their bodies start becoming so dysregulated that it's actually dangerous. Yeah, they can even die from it. They can go into a shock. So the only way for the organism to restore safety is to shut down all these emotions. And that now learn nobody will come when I need it. And these are the avoidant people that don't like intimacy. When things get too close, they panic, they run away. Um, they tend to prefer to deal with stress on their own because they learn to self-regulate really well because they only had themselves to, so they don't like to depend on others. They will constantly talk about independent. I'm so independent. I'm so proud of how independent I achieved all this myself. That's often a very avoidant person, right? While the anxious tend to need co-regulation from other people. They can't do that very well themselves right? And the secure can do both. They can both regulate self and with others. The last one is disorganized. And disorganizes the attachments that are closely related to very severe trauma. And it is a very extreme form of anxious and avoidant attachment put together in one. And what tend to happen was that the caregiver that was meant to provide comfort would do that sometimes. And at other times it would cause severe trauma that meant that child completely had to disassociate and get away and disengage from all emotion. So what happened is when you meet somebody with a disorganized attachment style, they tend to want to get close really quickly. That's the extreme side of their anxious attachment. They want, they're very intense. They'll be like, I love you after a few weeks and you're the most amazing person. It's very, very intense, right? And they almost create an artificial intensity to get you close, to soothe that anxiety, right? But then when you come close, the panic steps in 
because the per people that were close to them also harmed them. Now they become the extreme spectrum of avoidant, which is they suddenly disengage, they suddenly completely numb out. And for most balanced people, this will be so confusing. It will be like, what, what happened? They want to close, then I came close. Now they panic, they don't want to talk to me for two weeks. And then they will then come back again and be very anxious. And this is an attachment style that's very difficult to be in intimate relationship with. And again, that doesn't mean they don't deserve intimate relationships, but they certainly hopefully can also get individual therapy on the side, which will definitely be necessary to be able to create a safe, secure dynamic. That was an amazing breakdown, especially the last one kind of sounds like what people talk about love bombing, where they meet someone and it's, oh my God, this person is so into me. And then the person switches up and they're thinking, what just happened? You said I was the love of your life. Now you're not picking up my calls. So in, in you talking about all of these different attachment styles, one thing that keeps coming up is this talk about childhood and how that affects people's attachment styles. So is attachment theory based on how a person grows up? Is it really heavily tied to someone's childhood? Yes, it, it is. And it's primarily where these neurons are formed in the brain and the nervous system. So they become, they operate what we call the unconscious limbic system below awareness. And actually everything that comes through is processed through this neural network before you become aware of it. This is why people make interpretations of what happened based on what happened previously, right? That's why if suddenly, let's say your partner is late and you're very anxious, you might straight away come to the conclusion they don't care about me. Yeah. And that's because it's always been filtered through this old network before you even become aware. So you're not often even aware that these presumptions can very highly be incorrect because we have to think about the organism and especially the brain was actually designed as a predictive organism, meaning its main purpose is to use all data to predict what might happen in the future to ensure safety, right? Which is a very effective strategy because if every time we go to a door, we have to figure out how does the door open and is this safe to touch or not, that would require a lot of processing power, right? So this is really a effective system. However, it's also faulty because if those early experiences created a lack of safety, then now we interpret everything that's happening around us through this lens. And we also the slowest mammal to grow up. If you look at every other mammal, many animals are ready for, for full function in a couple of weeks, couple of months, maximum a couple of years, they can function on their own without parents. You know, we take 18, sometimes even longer before we are mammals who can actually go out and, and function ourselves and take care of ourselves, right? That's because we were the mammal that was most created to be adaptable to our environment. So we come with a much more blank slate, meaning that we can adapt much better to what is. And we even know now attachment starts even before we are born. If a mother has high levels of cortisol, stress hormone and adrenaline in the bloodstream, we know that the amygdala, which is part of the fear response, is more primed and grow larger already at birth, meaning that's already priming that child to say, I'm coming into a stressful and dangerous world, which is why we need to look out for pregnant women a lot more. We need to provide much more place for them to be able to have support, right? Because the more stressed they are, the more likely we get children that becomes very, that have a hard time functioning in society. Um, so yeah, this forms really early. And unless we become really aware and can then intervene with things like attachment theory and emotional focus couple therapy, we tend to relive through these again and again. And we tend to seek out partners that create what's called a reenactment. So let's say you had a very avoidant dad, right? And it's so typical, I get very anxious women. It doesn't mean that it's only women that could be have anxious attachment, but it's very typical coming in and they continue to seek out avoidant men again and again. And they're like, I don't know why I'm doing this. It's not good for me, but I'm attracted to them. And that's because on an unconscious level, they're going through what's called a reenactment. Their brain is trying to get a resolution for, by replaying the same scenario, hoping this time it can create a different ending. That was so good. You know, the first thing that I want to touch on that you said is the notion of, you know, even how it starts from birth, right? How the mother's emotions could affect the baby. And it made me think about something that I read from the newest book by Dr. Gabor, sorry, Dr. Gabor Mate. 
Mm -hmm. um, I think I have it here, The Myth of Normal. I just wanted mm -hmm. to make sure I got the title correct. And he talked about um, big trauma versus little trauma, right? And he was saying how when he was younger, um, his mom had to send him away with relatives for his safety. And even though he was a child and she was doing that for his safety, he kind of... I think he was like less than one or about one years old. That was kind of the catalyst to feeling like people were not reliable or people that love him weren't going to be there for him. Just feeling alone, right? Feeling very lonely. And then obviously that had, you know, ripple effects throughout his life. But it's just so interesting how deep these things can be mm -hmm. and how, you know, attachment theory, I feel like is kind of that red light blinking signal that's saying something's wrong here. This is you're acting out something deeper that needs to be looked at. And the attachment, your attachment style is not necessarily, um, it's the effects of a larger, of larger symptoms, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very, very interesting. And it's interesting how you talked about the anxious versus avoided um, relationship dance, because that's the one that I see a lot online. And I want to, you know, go deeper into that. But before I even go deeper into that, I know that, again, it was a lot of it is focused on how someone grew up and a lot of the stuff that was ingrained or programmed in their brain that they're not even aware of. But could someone's attachment styles change after dating someone? So for example, let's say a secure person enters a relationship with an avoidant person. Can they come out of that relationship either anxious or disorganized? Meaning, you know, they're open to love, but then they also have this fear of love when it becomes too close based on the experience that they had in a specific relationship or is it typically just from childhood so these attachment styles definitely change but also depending on who we're with um and so it's very unlikely that somebody with a secure attachment style would develop a disorganized attachment style because if they already have that foundation they are much more likely to be able to come back and disorganized usually is very early trauma um, of course, somebody with secure attachment can have trauma later in life, but even then we know that they're much less likely to get PTSD or complex PTSD from that trauma. So people who have more of these anxious attachment are also much more likely to be affected much worse, we know, by trauma. They're much more likely to end up in prison, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's a whole range of this, and we can even see it from a, a cultural perspective too, because people that have more access to resources they were more likely to be able to give their children that attention to create secure attachment, right? Which is why there's this proportional of some people in prison, etc. But anyway, that wasn't your main question. So yes, can it change? Absolutely. So the typical example that you mentioned, I think, was the anxious avoidant. And it's a good example of if we take somebody with, with anxious attachment, and again, this operates at a spectrum, right? It's not that everybody with anxious are the same level of anxiety or everybody with avoidant are the same level of avoidance. But if we take someone who's slightly anxious put them together with somebody very avoidant they will obviously come and try and get somebody to respond they need the closeness the avoidant will pull away because they feel very uncomfortable that will make the anxious feel more anxious so they will now chase more and that will make the other one pull away even more right and then you get this cycle where they create more and more anxiety more and more avoidance right so they make each other worse which is why that is probably the most difficult dynamic um, and that you see most often because they try to find their repair and their reenactment in each other, basically, right? So it's a very classical example, very common, but it tends to be very, very difficult to make these work. If you take an anxious one and put together with a securely attached, you will see that the anxious will slowly start becoming more and more secure. Because when they suddenly say, oh, I felt really, you know, so so also the, the secure can listen much more to underlying needs than other people can. So if suddenly this anxious person were criticizing them and, oh, I can't believe you out so late and you didn't call me, the secure attachment is much less likely to become defensive because they feel safe in themselves. They're much more likely to say, oh, so you didn't feel safe that I was out and didn't contact you. And then what do you need? And then, oh, I need you to check in with me when you're out. Okay, I can do that. So they're much more likely to respond to the underlying need 
And in that, you start creating safety for the other person. And what happens when you create safety, then all these behaviors, and I don't like the word needy, but we often call it that, right? But I think it's a very judgmental word. But that what people call neediness become less and less. I call it at a, a request for responsiveness, because that's really what it is. That become less and less, and the criticism become less and less, because the anxiety comes down, right? And then you will see them start forming a more secure bond. Um, but again, if you have two people in therapy, two people that are very aware and one is avoidant, one anxious, it's always going to be harder, but they can together create a secure dynamic, even though neither of them have a secure attachment style, because they can choose to spot their own pattern. They can choose not to engage in those automatic responses, and they can choose to then communicate their underlying attachment needs, and then they can learn how to become more responsive to each other, which is what we do in couples therapy, essentially. And then they start feeling more safe. Thank you for that, because it always seems like, you know, whenever I hear about the anxious and avoidant dance, I'm like, how can this work? But so many people have come out and say that they are able to make it work. But like you said, I think it requires a heavy sense of self-awareness to understand, oh, these are my patterns. I'm actually acting in avoidant ways or I'm actually acting in anxious ways. And if I'm recognizing these are my patterns, then when they flare up, I can be like, oh, I'm doing this again. And like you said, be able to create that more secure dynamic. And I also like the example that you gave with the secure person versus the um, anxious person. If they were to be in a relationship, the anxious person becoming more secure because mm -hmm. the secure person is able to pull them in. Is that the same for like a secure avoidant person or do you feel that people who tend to be secure aren't necessarily drawn to avoidant people because they can recognize that being mm. a pretty difficult situation to be in it's, it's a really interesting question and yes our attachment style also very much define who we find attractive right mm. and this is why it's super fascinating when when people say oh but i know these people are not good for me but they're the only people i'm attracted to what we see is that when people come into therapy and they start feeling a more sense of security and safety and secure attachment in themselves because they at least have a therapy who's very responsive to them right which is what they need their nervous system needs then they start slowly becoming attracted to different people. Exactly. So, you know, I've seen plenty of people who came in and maybe had a quite anxious attachment style. And as they started feeling more and more securely attached, they weren't so attractive anymore to very avoidant partners. They started becoming much more attracted to people that were actually responsive to them. Right. And I think, again, there's a lot of these dating fallacies by so-called dating experts without any actual qualification who will teach you all these different games that you have to play. Right. And they're completely missing the cue because what they're doing is they're actually reinforcing staying in defensive strategies where there can't be intimacy. So what they're doing is they're staying in the survival. I'm in danger. I need survival strategies. Right. And in that, you can't actually have intimacy. You can't create safety. So that reinforce insecurity, that reinforce instability, right? Which is why they don't tend to be able to maintain relationship, even though they give a lot of advice. Um, so yeah, I think that's important to be aware of. And also just be mindful because you're right. It's about having self-awareness and people can make something work. I'm not saying that nobody can work because they're anxious and avoidant together. We have to just be mindful and know that this predictive brain that we have often is very faulty in its prediction and especially if we didn't have good frameworks growing up so it's being able to say oh i feel i think he doesn't care about me because he didn't call me right he's out with his friend and he didn't call, he doesn't care about me oh this is what my brain initially predict it doesn't mean it's true right because often i know that this prediction is incorrect so it's starting to pick up these incorrect predictions of the future that the brain is trying to do to help us but they're no longer correct, right? Because they're based on an old model. And then we can widen the gap between when we feel something and think something and when we respond. Because if we respond straight away, we will go on autopilot, which is the old responses. So we need to learn how do I regulate enough to not respond straight away? Because then I can start building new patterns. And something, there are two things that I wanted to um quickly touch on and to your point about you know the more secure you become the more your 
desire or attraction to certain people change. And I think that makes a whole lot of sense. And then the second thing I was thinking about too is that I've seen situations that look like someone who is typically avoidant will get into a relationship and then all of a sudden they're super anxious because mm -hmm. they're dating another avoidant. Have you run into situations like that? And why do you think that is if you have run into that? Yeah, I think we also have to remember that a lot of us walk around and don't really show what's actually going on. So people can maybe appear to be quite avoidant on the outside because they want to appear confident, but actually feel very anxious right on the inside. Um, and as you said, if two avoidants are with each other, they tend to actually get on quite well in the main that none of them have a big need for intimacy. They tend to mainly base their relationship on things like physical gratification, having sex together, um, you know, doing their careers independently. So they tend to be able to actually get on in that way. They don't feel very close or connected, but they tend to be able to just function because none of them really crave that intimacy, right? It only seems to become a problem when there's somebody who wants that intimacy, which someone secure or anxious who really crave that and that can't be given. But yes, somebody who's a bit avoidant can certainly become anxious for sure. And we have to remember that avoidant attachment is also an anxious attachment style, right? When they actually measure the neurological response, people who are avoidant feel equally amount of anxiety internally, right? They have just come up with different coping strategies. So it's important to know that these attachment styles does not say much about how we feel. It says something about how we have learned to respond, right? And that's quite important because we can tend to presume that, oh, someone with avoidant doesn't experience pain. They are not anxious. That's not true at all. We know that that's a very opposite. They can be very dysregulated. They can experience a lot of anxiety, but they don't tend to go out and ask for help. They don't go to out and share. They're the people that when they're stressed or anxious or depressed, they pull away. They don't come and say, I need your help, right? While the anxious tend to reach out to anyone who wants to listen, right? So these are just different coping strategies. So it doesn't mean that somebody who is avoidant does not experience anxiety internally. And I would assume as well that, you know, like you said, all of these things are a spectrum and someone might be super secure in a relationship, but when it comes to their work environment, depending on what experience that they had in the past, they might be more avoidant or anxious. So it, would it be fair to say that we all could potentially have a mix of these different attachment styles, depending on the situationships or situation that we're in, because I assume this is not just for romantic relationships. Yes, and you're spot on, and we do. So we tend to have a default, which is the, the primary strategy that we have, but you're absolutely right. Of course, it's dependent on context. So I'll give you an example. So I am lucky because I had very stable parents growing up. So I was growing up and I got a secure base from them, right? So I have trust that I'll be okay on my own. And I also am very happy to be intimate and, and get close to someone. And I trust that most people will respect my boundaries and, and my needs. And, and in that is a general secure base when I relate. However, that doesn't mean I can't be knocked out of balance. And I know, so I have a son, um, which is how I got into psychedelic assisted therapy, who's got a life limited condition. And sometimes he has to spend extensive time in hospital and go through lots of surgeries. Like the last two months, he had five surgeries, right? He just came out yesterday. And in that period, my nervous system become more anxious. And I know I need more reassurance from my partner. Right. So there's no doubt that my nervous system was much less in balance than it normally is. I found it harder to regulate. I would get more triggered by small things that normally wouldn't trigger me at all. Like her going to the cinema with her friend normally would not bother me the slightest. But because I was in hospital with a screaming child and she was out and it's, that suddenly bothered me. Right. And I started feeling anxious and stressed. But the difference is because I have a secure base. I could communicate that underlying need and avoidant would hardly ever probably go to and say, listen, but this is happening and therefore I feel insecurity and my need is for a bit more reassurance for you while my son is in hospital, right? But that's what I said to my partner. And the reason I did that and an avoidant wouldn't do that or very unlikely to do it is because I have trust that there will be responsiveness. So it feels safe to say that, right? And because I do that, I'm more likely now to actually get what I need, right? So she said, oh, of course, I didn't realize that, but I'll make sure to do that. And that totally makes sense. 
And then you readjust, right? And you reestablish safety. So that's an example that certain circumstances can definitely knock us out of balance. Um, but it's easy again to come back to balance if we have this baseline. Thank you for that example. And I, I want to talk about the psychedelic part of your expertise a little bit later, because I, I know you just mentioned that with your son. So I'm excited to kind of dig deeper into that. But I also wanted to talk about how really understanding attachment theory and attachment styles can really benefit couples. Obviously, we've alluded to it throughout the whole conversation, but there was something that you said that I wanted to respond to, but forgot to was this notion of, you know, dating experts or people talking about how to play games when you're getting to know someone. And I always kind of thought that was silly because if you start off playing games, then where's the opportunity to create real intimacy and get to know this person? And then your relationship is predicated on games. And a lot of times, I think that couples are still playing games with each other, even though they're married and they've been together for, you know, 10, 20 years, it becomes this like ego war, right? So I just wanted to kind of really highlight how understanding attachment theory and different attachment styles can really help couples communicate better and create better intimacy. Yes, of course. And it certainly can. And I think when we talk about playing games, why do people play games? They play games to have a felt sense of control over the environment, right? Why do they have the need? When do we need to control our environment? When we feel anxious, when the fear response is firing up in our brain, then we need to control our environment more, right? So that's essentially what it is. People who try to play games are actually people who are in a survival mode because they feel highly unsafe. So people that feel safe don't tend to play games. They don't need to, right? Because they don't think that the threat there is a threat in the environment. They feel safe in that environment. So it's a big indicator as well of somebody's internal state when they play a lot of games, right? Or if they don't play games and you're spot on, it's impossible to get intimacy from that place if you try and play games. And we actually know that secure, safe attachment is the best and most effective survival strategy. And we know that when a child feels safe, they don't become less independent, they become more independent actually, because the children that are most likely to go out and explore, most likely to be willing to take risk, are the ones that have a secure base. They go out and they know I can explore the world, but if I fall down from a tree, I can go back and mommy and daddy will help me, right? And because they trust that, they can go explore. And that relates to when we become adults. The same patterns you see, the people that are more comfortable with risk, with uncertainty, are people that had that secure base and it makes it easier for them to go explore. And yes, couples can change this together. And this is what's so beautiful about emotional focus couple therapy, which is obviously what I what I do and also the most well-researched couple therapy practice. And it's the only one that has consistent research backing up that it works also long-term. There's no other couples therapy that actually have that. And the reason it works is that it functions on some very simple steps that is based on the very core human needs we have for survival, which is a sense of belonging. We all have a sense of belonging from the day we are born till the day we die, right? We are social creatures at heart. And therefore, the first part when people come in is to identify what is a dance that we got stuck in, right? We call it a dance because a relationship is kind of like a dance, right? We come in, we fall for each other, we're listening to the same tune, we are having a good time, we're jamming. And then over time, we don't realize well, we're listening now to two different songs and the beat doesn't match. And I start stepping on your feet and you're like, oh, why are you doing that for? And I'm like, oh, why are you not stepping right in rhythm? Do you get the analogy? So this is what happens, right? We're no longer listening to the same tune. But when we realize that it's not the partner that's the enemy, because when people come in, we live in a culture that always want to blame somebody. That means either it's my fault and I have to feel blame and bad about myself, or it's your fault and I can blame somebody else so I don't have to feel blame. However, what if there was nobody to blame? What if there were just two people trying to find safety in the best way that the organism learned to do? Because that's really what it is. And when people can see these core dances, they realize it's a dance that's the enemy. It's not my partner. And when we can externalize it, we know from human psychology, we tend to come together against the common enemy, right? Now they see the dance as the enemy, not the other person and not themselves. That creates a possibility of change, right? So now they can spot and say, oh, we are going into whatever they choose to call this dance that they 
they identified, right? And now they can instead say, okay, what is the underlying needs that I actually need? What are the attached? Because people never separate because the husband didn't take out the bin. That's what they come and tell you, right? Oh, he never helped with this. What is actually being said underneath this is when somebody say, oh, he didn't help with this. He didn't help with this. I hear human beings saying, I felt alone. Yeah, I felt alone. I felt unsupported. It wasn't about the bin. It wasn't about somebody forgetting the dishes. Nobody separate or argue or destroy their marriage and separate from their kids because of that. It's because they felt alone. So when we can get to the attachment need and we can express that to the partner, suddenly their defenses go down. Because when we're blaming and attacking, they have no other choice than going to fight or flight too or collapse. And we can never get anywhere good when we're in that state, right? But now by expressing vulnerably these attachment needs, the other person actually goes into compassion instead, right? And of course it might take a few times because it's new. And in the beginning they might be, what the heck is happening here? And with a few times, they start feeling safe enough to hear it. And then you start helping them responding. And look, what are you creating right now? You're creating a secure attachment dynamic, which is responsiveness, you know, expression of need and responsiveness. You're basically restructuring what they didn't have as a child. So you're recreating a safe dynamic. We call it restructuring emotional experience. We're giving them a new emotional experience, but where they got the responsiveness that they needed. And in that, the nervous system starts feeling safe. And guess what? All the practical issues people come in with are so easy to solve once a nervous system is calm. And they're impossible to solve when they're inflated and in fight or flight response. That was so good. I loved the dance analogy. I love dancing just for fun. Fun story. Um, when I was 13, I told my sister, I'm going to run away to Hollywood and become a professional dancer. So I love dance and moving the body. And I really love the mm. analogy about, you know, when it comes to couples, it's about being on the same tune, you know, being in rhythm with each other, you know, yes. doing the the steps in sync. It's not you know, you versus me. And when the steps start to become out of sync with each other, that's when you need to kind of pay attention to what's going on. Because I think that's the part that a lot of couples miss. Like, when did we start being unaligned, right? And mm -hmm. I really love what you said about, you know, it's not about taking the trash out. It's about the feelings underneath that, yes. the emotions underneath that. And there was this um, show that I watched a couple of months ago, it's called couples therapy. And every time a couple had a breakthrough, it was because at some point they realized all of their reactions, all of the things that they were doing, all of the feelings that they had, they were able to pinpoint the emotion behind those actions and those feelings. Right. Mm -hmm. I remember this one woman, she was just so, harsh towards her partner. He wanted intimacy. He wanted connection, but she could only see what was wrong with it. She felt mm -hmm. like she was being stifled. And underneath all of that, there was this fear that he was lying, right? And she felt that because of what happened to her in her childhood, her father and the men in her life kind of abandoning her. So mm -hmm. there was this like constant fear of abandonment. And that was kind of those emotions were the reason why she was acting out and doing whatever she was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and once she realized that, it was kind of like a, a light bulb moment for both of them, right? And I think the cool thing about attachment theory is if you're in couples therapy and you have a therapist who's kind of walk, walking you through this, it's like, hey, give me your glasses. Let me put this on. What is your vision like? What are you seeing? How are you seeing the world? How are you interacting with the world? And to your point about that being able to create that compassion and empathy for your partner. And it's like, again, we're not enemies. There's a common problem here and we can, you know, solve it together. You know, you have two imperfect people who, who've had a story, who've had a history coming together, trying to make it work. Obviously it takes two to tangle. Two people want have to want to make it work for it to work. But in, in those settings, when you have two people who want to make it work, I do think it's it's possible to have those breakthroughs. So, yes, that was yeah. a lot, but it was beautiful you know you're how you spot said on. that. And you know what, you're spot on. And like you said, it takes two people to dance, which is important. When people come into couple therapy, it only is effective as possible.
most people want to do that and make it work because otherwise it's like one dancing and the other one is standing still and you're dragging their feet around on the floor it's never going to be a great dance right it's just not and eventually the person dragging the other one around is going to get exhausted right and disillusioned so you're right it does take two people to dance and want to do it um, but the beautiful is now we have a structure of understanding and we can also easily spot what has gone on because there's a slow cycle, like I described, maybe anxious trying to get avoid and pulling away, then more anxious would become criticism and blame. Then the other one pulling away more, the avoidant tend to say things like I can never get it right or I'm going to fail. That's typical words of an avoidant, right? And, and then they get into this slowly, but there's also attachment injuries. And attachment injuries are really significant and important to understand because that an attachment injury was if one of the partners were in a key moment of distress. So a great example is like I said, I'm in hospital, my son is really well or unwell. He had a surgery, he almost died on, on doing surgery, right? And I'm obviously in a lot of distress because they don't know what to do. I can see he is suddenly deteriorating. Now in this moment, is my partner able to respond? And there could be a million reasons why they can't. Maybe they're overwhelmed, but the nervous system doesn't care. In these instances, which is what the organism perceives as life and death survival, there's only black and white, meaning is this person there for me or not? And if the person is not able to be there, or it could be a wife coming home saying, I have cancer and the husband is overwhelmed. So he just walks away, right? And she feels so alone in a critical moment of attachment need that it creates these injuries that basically color the whole relationship. And even though everything else is good and they kind of moved on, something lingers and just isn't right. And when we find these attachment injuries, we tend to be able to go back and repair them and then everything suddenly feels back to good again, right? And people often are very confused because they will come in and say, but we get on so well and we have a lot of fun and we share all these interests and yet we don't feel connected. And what we tend to find is when we go back that at some point in a relationship, there was an attachment injury where one person really needed the other and for whatever reason, the others couldn't show up, right? And we have to go back and acknowledge that the person have to take responsibility they might not have meant to hurt, they might have valid reasons, but they still have to take responsibility for how their action impacted the other person. And then they need to discuss how they can prevent that from happening so trust can be restored again, right? Um, and it's beautiful to see that because suddenly again, you kind of see all these problems just disappear. It's almost like magic. And suddenly people are back in a flow again. Oh my God, I love that term, attachment injury. Yes, because there are moments in life that happen that are really, really critical, life-changing moments. And if your partner doesn't respond the way you expect them to respond, that does cause this heaviness within the heart or this injury that you're talking about. Because you said secure a secure attachment style within a relationship is someone expressing their needs and there's a response to that, right? So if someone has tremendous need at a very critical time and it's not being responded to appropriately or the person doesn't acknowledge like oh i dropped the ball here that could just continue to fester so that i think that's really good because i've never thought about it that way but you just saying that now just was another light bulb moment mm -hmm. for me and i hope it's a lot of it's another light bulb moment for people who are listening to this thinking my relationship is good but there's this part that i have some sort of like animosity for or something here that's a little bit misaligned and thinking like, oh, this might have been like some sort of attachment injury or feeling injured or let down mm -hmm. or let down by the response of my partner and kind of attacking that head on. That that was really good. That was really good. <laughs> um, okay. So just really quickly before we pivot into the psychedelics portion of this conversation, Someone who's listening to this and they recognize that, oh, I think I might be kind of anxious or avoidant, right? Because we can't go back into the past and relive our childhood. How can an adult learn to be more secure, right? And how mm -hmm. much does personal individual therapy help to supplement couples therapy? Because I think, you know, the individual also has to have some level of self-awareness in order to properly engage in couples therapy. Yes, that's a really good question. And I think individual therapy has a place. However, I think we have to think about all these injuries were relational injuries. 
Um, so somehow I've often seen that that traditional therapy, and I am a therapist too, but I often seen and have to say that it fail a lot of people because coming in one hour a week and having that does not change the nervous system, right? So couples therapy allow us with somebody who's already close to us, a real close attachment, meaning they also have much more impact than a therapist have, right? And you spend a lot more time with them. And if you can help them start creating it, they can really restructure these experiences. But what do people do if they're not in a relationship? Of course, they can do therapy is one way of doing it. There's also quite recent research now, since we are going to start talking about psychedelics anyway, that has showed that certain psychedelics can actually has a huge impact on restructuring attachment styles especially anxious attachment, not so much um, avoidant attachment, but anxious attachment in particular seem to be able to benefit quite hugely by potential, you know, psychedelic experiences done in the right set and setting and safe environment, um, which is very exciting because it's hopefully something we'll have more research into. And then we also can start thinking about if you're a single person or if you're not, is what are the people you spend a large amount of time with? because they are the people that had a huge impact on your attachment. If you spend a lot of time on people that are not available, that are not responsive to you, then that's going to reinforce anxiety and it's going to reinforce the old narrative. People aren't going to respond to me. I'm not worthy or blah, 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 whatever these narratives are within form around that, right? To make sense of it. So it's really important to start looking at choosing people, friends, and whether it's family members, and spending time around people that can give us that responsiveness. It doesn't mean that they always can give us what we want. You know, a child also can't always have what they want. My kids would love to have chocked it all the time. I don't give them that, right? Because it's not good for them. So there's also a place for us to then acknowledge. But even if I can't give them chocolate, I say, I really get you want chocolate because it's so tasty. I can't give it to you because X, Y, and Z, meaning I'm still responsive. Yeah, I'm not ignoring them. I'm not dismissing it. I'm not blaming them. I'm not saying you're stupid. Why would you want chocolate? I'm saying, of course you want chocolate. It's sweet and tastes nice, but we can't always have chocolate. It could be your partner who wants to do something sexually you don't want, and it's totally okay. But then we can still acknowledge them. Right. So there's a huge difference in saying, oh, I can't believe you want to do that, which is shaming and create distance. Right. And now they will pull away. They don't want to get shamed again. They probably won't express their needs to you honestly going forward or what they like sexually. Instead of saying, that's really beautiful. You want that. I can totally imagine how that could be a turn on. However, it's not something I can do with you. And in that now they're not alone anymore. Because there's somebody who's willing to at least hear them, someone who's willing to acknowledge them, right? And that can actually create closeness even when we can't give them what they want. Thank you so much for that. Because I something I wanted to ask but almost forgot to is, do you think we put too much pressure on romantic relationships? Because I know you talked about, for example, for a single person, you know, they can start working on having better attachment styles based on like the like the friends and family they choose to interact with. But it made me think of, do you think we put too much pressure on romantic relationships for our partners to be everything to us all the time? Yes, it's, it's the answer. We definitely do. And the fact is, again, it has something to do with a more structural issue around how modern Western societies are structured, which is that we live often further away from family, from different friends. We are often more isolated in that way. Um, so we tend to not have communal communities around that provide different roles, which is originally we were meant to live and the brain is designed to live and relate to 200 people approximately at max, right? And now we're in cities. I'm in as close to London where there's 8.5 million. This is why people shut down because literally we were not designed to relate to that many different people, right? And we can seem very cold in that because the nervous system just said this is too much overwhelm shut down so yes we do because you know the partner can't be the person you find funny the support the sexy person the person you share all your interests with the one you found safety with so we do need to have different resources right 
And actually women are much better than this, also cultural than men are. We know that in breakups, women tend to deal much better with it than men do because women tend to have maintained other relationships while they're in a relationship, while a lot of men have the tendency to negate a lot of friends when they're in a relationship and put everything on the relationship. And suddenly when it's not there, they're like, oh my God, I don't have anyone here. And they feel very, very alone, right? So it's absolutely critical to have these different elements outside the relationship so you can get support from different people, so you can laugh with different people, so you have these different resources available, right? It's definitely your partner cannot supply all that because it was meant to be a community and not one person who gave us this. I agree with you. I think we need to lean more on other types of community outside of our romantic relationship. Though I do think the person you choose to be with in a romantic sense somewhat plays a heavier role in influencing your life in certain ways. But to your point, I do think that we're not just meant to put all of that on one person. So thank you for yes. uh, explaining that. Okay. So I know that your expertise, you you bridge in your expertise, you bridge the gap between traditional therapy and alternative healing practices. Mm -hmm. And you do that through um, facilitating psychedelic exploration. Is that correct? Yes, so I support people in in their journeys. And again, I just because this is a very sensitive topic, I just have to say, you know, people obviously have to follow whatever laws that are in their jurisdictions and their country. Mm -hmm. So this is not me telling people that they should do psychedelics, but I think I, I create awareness around potential harm reduction, but also the potential benefit um, of something that is coming out. A lot of very exciting and very, very encouraging research at the moment that seem to have a lot of application. And they're even doing research into how psychedelics can be used in couples therapy. And the initial research is very, very optimistic. Yes. And, you know, I've been hearing a lot about psychedelics now for a couple of years and I know very little about it. So how would you explain what psychedelics are? So psych this is a really good question because there's so much misunderstanding around this. Psychedelics is what's called a neurological enhancer. And that might for a lot of people be what is he talking about. So basically it does a couple of things, or most psychedelics does this, which is why they have so incredible potential. So there's one part of your brain referred to as a default mode network. And what this is, is your sense of ego, but also your construct of identity. And this is a part that decides what it allowed to come through to your awareness, what is not allowed, right? And basically what happens is with pretty much every mental health condition from depression, from anxiety, from OCD, et cetera, et cetera, addiction is there become a rigidity of the mind. The mind become very rigid in how it can see the world, right? Because of these construct of this is who I am, this idea that I am this, I'm a man, I'm this color, all these identities, right? Can keep us very, very stuck. And it tend to also be what cause conflict. Actually, a really interesting research study was done with Israelis and Palestinians and they gave them an ayahuasca ceremony. And in the beginning, these people couldn't stand each other. At the end of it afterwards, all that animosity has gone away because this construct of you're Israeli, I am Jew, etc., etc., or Palestinian, da, 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 all these identities of countries, of race, of religion just disappeared because they are formed in this part of the brain and held there. So when that shuts down, we can suddenly see new flexibilities, new options. We can interpret ourselves and other people in a new way. So all these fearful constructs we talked about with attachment styles that we interpret the world through, they can be shut down for a while. And suddenly we can see maybe he didn't mean to do this. Maybe he didn't do this because he doesn't care. It opens up the mind. And then the rest of the brain have this amazing interconnectedness that we don't see that allow us to access new possibilities, right? Which is incredible. And it also lower the fear response in the brain. But what it does at the same time is it create neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. And what that means is it actually create new cell growths in the brain and new connections between cells very, very rapidly. And we have a lot of this as children and then it becomes less and less with age. But for a period after taking psychedelics, this growth in the brain is really exponentially. And it's almost, I say, like imagine being a child for a little while, which is also why it's super important when doing this that people don't just do it at random places somewhere because that can be harmful. And if they don't know how to integrate it, it can be very overwhelming. 
but done with the right person in the right setting and with the right integration, this allows us almost to restructure the brain, right? And reconstruct some of these things that weren't integrated well if people had trauma or other things, which is why it's showing so promising results. Have you worked with couples who have taken psychedelics together? And when you're taking a psychedelic, do you have to set an intention of what you want to work through? Or mm -hmm. is it more spontaneous? So I, because it's not legal in the UK, I haven't been able to work where I was doing it administrated to couples. But yes, I had couples that have taken MDMA. Um, obviously at their own risk, etc. And I can obviously try and advise them of ways to, you can do testing and other things to try and make sure it's as safe as possible, right? And and ways to do it, things you have to go through, checks beforehand, um, how you prepare set and setting. But yes, and I have seen how it can be so profound because especially MDMA, which is slightly different actually to the other psychedelics, because while, you know, the psychedelic experience we talked about primarily are things that happen with magic mushrooms, with LSD, with ayahuasca, but these ego dissolutions are where suddenly that default mode network shut down and you can see everything totally different. It's not necessarily what happened on MDMA and you don't tend to have hallucinations or anything like that. You're more present with MDMA, which is why it can be good in that context as people can then still actually communicate, which can be very difficult if you're on psilocybin magic mushrooms, right? You're normally not in a state where you can communicate well with others. On MDMA, you can. What MDMA does is that when couples come in and they're really struggling, their fear response is heightened. They're now seeing their partner as a threat, right? Meaning it's very difficult to get through to each other when you're perceiving the other one as being a threat, right? It's very hard to hear each other. What MDMA does is it lower the amygdala. It really shuts down that response, which is the fear response, right? And suddenly it become possible to hear each other in a way that has almost been impossible to before. Suddenly somebody who, a very avoidant person who'd never been able to say anything vulnerable can suddenly express their emotions really vulnerable. And suddenly what it does is it doesn't fix everything, but it suddenly give people a felt experience again, not a cognitive thought, but a felt experience. This is possible too. And we did this and we were okay. And that creates a framework for how they can do things differently. It doesn't mean people should continue to take MDMA, right? It shouldn't be a substitute to make the relationship work, but it's just a gateway where the mind again has been so stuck, right? To see actually this is possible too. Thank you for sharing that. And can you just, you know, talk about some of the risks and what people need to think about or consider before embarking on mm. a psychedelic experience? And this is a, a great question. And of course, the, the different compounds have different safety profiles. Um, I think overall, psychedelics are really, really safe. And that's what the research has shown us done in the right way, the right set and setting. However, that doesn't mean harm can't happen. So MDMA, like we talked about before, can cause change in temperature, for example. And, you know, the, but uh, it's important to say that the people who tend to be harmed are uh, primarily either they mix things up, meaning they mix with different compounds that shouldn't be mixed. Maybe they're out taking alcohol and then take MDMA. So there are certain mixtures that certainly can be dangerous, right? And, and we have had people dying from that. It's very rare, but it has happened. So it's when people do these things very not carefully, right? So there's a physiological risk in people taking MDMA. They might go out, they dance again when people do it, not in a very conscious way, and they forget to drink water. That has also caused, again, not many, but a few deaths, right? Or people drink too much. So this is, again, tend to be when people do it in an unsafe setting, right? These are not meant to be taken as something that you go out and just do a party with, even though that's primarily where they become used. And that's also what then happened when they became illegal, right? Even though they can have huge potential therapeutic benefits, but done in a safe setting, it's extremely risk uh, or, or safe. So if we look at magic mushrooms, psilocybin, there had not been a single reported case of people dying from taking psilocybin. It's almost impossible to overdose. You'll get sick just from eating before you can overdose. However, there's a risk of psychological harm, right? And that is definitely real. So, you know, with some very strong compounds, like what part of the active ingredients in ayahuasca is called DMT, people smoke DMT 
and it can literally in 15 seconds so quickly skyrocket you into a different universe, almost like you are God in, in right. And that can be so overwhelming for people and especially done in an unsafe setting, like out in a party and you have no integration, you don't know what to expect. That can be harmful and that can take Sometimes I heard stories and I, even a friend who took years to come back, but it's because it's done in frankly stupid ways. It is really stupid to do it in this way. It's not done in a safe way. Psilocybin again, very safe if done in the right way. In the research studies, I think out of, was it 25,000, but however many, there's been thousands of participants and there was one person, one person who had a very adverse psychological, but the other ones showed you know, fantastic benefits. And that's because it's done in a really safe way. There's a preparation phase. They tell people what to expect. They build trust with the therapists that are going to be there. Normally there's two therapists present, a man and a woman of each gender, right? They prepare specific music. It's not done with any other people around or unsafe elements, right? They make sure that everything is there, snacks, water, everything that's required, right? They're literally sitting there just to help you. That's their only task. Um, and also psilocybin comes on a bit slower. So it takes about, it's not like smoking DMT. It takes about half an hour to an hour. So that means it's a slow, gradual. It doesn't just send you in to complete oblivion, right? And again, then they provide therapy as well afterwards, right? So afterwards, you're not left alone, maybe struggling to make sense of what happened because it can be overwhelming on higher doses to suddenly lose a sense of identity. That can certainly be scary, right? It has a possibility to restructure your personality. And I think people should always ask, is the benefit bigger than the potential risk with anything they do, right? And I would always say, even in places where it's legal and people can do that, ask yourself first, is there other ways I could do that? I remember I had someone, a uh, a friend, a female friend come and say, oh, Thomas, I had this breakup. I'm feeling really bad. He just broke up a week ago. I'm feeling a bit sad. Should I take psychedelics? I said, absolutely not. Grieving a, a long-term partner is a healthy response and it's a natural process. Psychedelic isn't meant to be used to disassociate or not feel, right? Or not go through natural processes. So that was not an adequate place to use psychedelics. And I would normally say, have you tried other things? Have you tried therapy? Have you tried X, Y, and Z? And if people come to a place where they really haven't, there is no other way out for them, and they're in severe distress, then it might be something worth considering, right? Because the benefit probably is much higher at that stage than the potential risk. Thank you. I feel like that was a great barometer that you set out there. You know, does do the risks outweigh the benefits or the benefits outweigh the risks doing research, making sure you're in the right environment with the right practitioner and also, you know, not just taking it to numb yourself because you're probably going to feel a lot more <laughs> mm -hmm. when you take psychedelics. So thank you for that. That That's very interesting. I want to ask you about your podcast, Exploring Humanity. Mm -hmm. Why did you create it and what is it about? So the podcast is primarily about, well, I guess in the title, Exploring the Human Experience, right? And it's looking at the different elements of of how we experience the world and more importantly, how we as humans process what we experience. Cause that had always really, really fascinated me because we never experience what is. We experience the interpretation of what is. Even the construct of color, they're just different spectrum of light, but color only exists and happens when it gets interpreted, right? Through the lens of your eye and through your brain, your visual spectrum then creates it into different colors right? Same with smell. So it's a brain that creates the construct of what this is, but it's also the brain that limits what we can experience in this construct, right? Because we are only allowed to experience with the, the limitation of the senses that we have. So I think once we understand how we process the world, it becomes much easier to not be so rigid in how we interpret the world and actually recognizing that the way we see the world might not be the correct way. And that's also a beautiful way that I've seen through psychedelics and that I explore on the podcast is this flexibility of mind, what they categorize, they call it openness. Meaning I noticed after my psychedelic experience, I became so much more open to other people's perspective. Before I would get quiet, oh, I know better, I'm the expert. And I didn't like when people didn't have the same opinion. 
now it doesn't bother me anymore. Right. And that's something I really noticed changed after my psychedelic experience, this sense of openness. So I think the podcast is really about that. Understanding how do we process this experience we call life and what impact does that have on us? That's beautiful. I think you're you're definitely speaking my language. And, you know, I'm really a big believer that we all have a piece to the puzzle, a piece of the truth, but not the whole truth. Mm -hmm. And to your point about the different color spectrums and how we see it and how our brain interprets it, someone could be looking at the same type of blue, but see a completely different shade or a shade that we may not have any sort of perception of. So it's very interesting to kind of see how everyone else is viewing their own reality, right? Because we're all yes. on the same earth, but we have different perceptions of our day-to-day -day lives, which is very fascinating and kind of takes me out of this black and white sort of thinking. You know, I feel like there's so much gray and the gray yes. is in the shared experiences other people have that we are not able to, or the experiences other people have that we're not able to perceive. So yes. that's really amazing. That's beautiful. Um, you've dropped so much wisdom throughout the podcast, but I always have to ask for final words of wisdom to the listeners. It could be about everything we've been talking about. It could be related to that or something completely different that you kind of keep in your back pocket. I think it would be the acknowledgement and acceptance that we need other humans. We live in a world that glorify individuality, but it's not how we were meant to function. And that's why so many people are not functioning well and struggling, accepting that it's okay to need others. And it's actually how we are wired. Beautiful. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about your work, if they want to work with you, or if they want to listen to your podcast? Of course, we can probably put the links in the description because there's a few different ones, right? So I do so much. I do my ecstatic dances. I do my therapy, couples therapy. Um, that's a podcast. There's psychedelicmedicine.earth, which is if people want information around that. So, you know, maybe we put the links and people can just go, go check out whatever they're interested in. Absolutely. I'm going to put all of the links to your websites and social media handles in the show notes for people to check out. But Thomas, thank you so much for stopping by the show. This was an amazing conversation. Oh, it's been my pleasure and great questions that you asked, by the way. <laughs>